Hello and welcome back to my channel. I'm Zach. You may know me as the Swiftologist and on this channel I like to make thoughtful content about pop culture and vlogs too. It's been a couple months, one month, two months, I don't know, time passes me by and I don't notice anymore since Midnight's came out and I'm very excited to kind of delve into a little bit where these songs have settled into my ranking. I feel like when I first heard Midnight's I was so bamboozled and overwhelmed that I had absolutely no idea what I thought or where to place these songs in terms of my own personal rankings and also how I felt about the album on the whole. So today we're going to delve into that a little bit more and I'm going to be fixing the track list. This is a series that is backed by high demand. I know a lot of you like these videos where I go through Taylor's, shall we say, often shambolic organizations of her tracks and try and make a cohesive story out of the record. Keep in mind that I do tend to cut songs entirely. So if that upsets you, you should go somewhere else. If you don't know my channel, we have critical and creative discussions about Taylor Swift's art here. And if you are not interested in having a critical discussion or you just want to say that you love Taylor so much and everything she does is amazing, then this is not the place for you. So I encourage you to click off. If you like the idea of critical and analytical discussions about Taylor Swift, then you are in the right place. Now, before we get into it, I just want to let you guys know that we are going to be doing a new episode of The Evolution of a Snake, getting into a very in detail, our one month later thoughts on Midnight's. And that is going to be much more in-depth in this video, kind of going in to where this album fits into her discography and where we think that Taylor's going to go from here with my co-host Madeline. So I'll leave that linked below and you can check that out at your leisure if you may choose. And I would also really like to encourage you guys to take a look at my vlogs. I just went to a two week trip in Japan and I have created a series called Solo in Tokyo where I started out vlogging, trying to like vlog some sort of personal journey. And then I unexpectedly experienced a loss in my family when I was on the trip and that completely changed it for me. And the third episode of that is going to be coming very shortly. I have two episodes out right now. I would love it if you went and checked those out and had a look. I'm super proud of them. But you know, today we're back doing the regular programming. We're talking about Taylor and I'm doing a tier list and this is what I've got so far for my tier. So we have the God tier. These are the songs that I think may, you know, at some point reach into my top 20 or top 10 Taylor Swift songs of all time. I have high standards and I have very specific things that I like from Taylor Swift songs. So I'm going to be very discerning with this category. Very, very good is the next category down. I feel like some of the songs will fall into here. These are the songs that are like really good. I listen to all the time, but I wouldn't like, I haven't imprinted upon them as I have songs like Holy Ground, Right Where You Left Me, Cruel Summer, you know, the superstars. Not terrible is just the kind of like whatever songs, good, neither good nor bad, kind of just there. Meh are the songs that I am leaning towards disliking, but not fully on the train of Not Today, which is the final tier that, you know, I wanted to write Not Today Staten, but it wouldn't give me enough characters on this stupid tier list website. So I guess it's trying to force me to be a little bit nicer than I'm inclined to be. Let's just jump right into it, shall we? Okay, Lavender Haze. Lavender Haze is an interesting one for me because I, whenever I listen to it, I like it. And when I decide to stick through it, when it comes on shuffle, I enjoy it. But I think that the overall like theme of Lavender Haze and it being the first bookend, like the introduction to the album, is not what I want it to be. And I think that, you know, the topic and the subject matter that she's discussing on Lavender Haze, we've been through it a million times. I hate the media. I hate the expectations placed upon me. I want to marry Joe, but like, I don't want you to talk about me wanting to marry him, even though I referenced it a million times in all my songs. So Lavender Haze for me is going into very, very good because I do like that it has a new sound. I like that she worked with different producers on it. And I love it when she breaks away from Jack Antonoff, even just for a second, not because I hate Jack Antonoff, just because I want to see what else she can come up with. What else is in that noggin of hers? All right, now we have Maroon. Oh my God, this is already so hard. Okay, Maroon, I don't know if I want to put it into the God tier. It is very, very good for sure. Maroon is a great song. I just think there's a lot of negative space in Maroon and it feels like it's missing something. Like there's a lot of like emptiness between lines, between lyrics, even in the chorus. It feels very spare and in a way where, you know, sometimes vagueness is good. Like Cruel Summer, the lyrics in Cruel Summer are a little bit vague, but the overall like ambiance that is created with that song is so specific and unique. Maroon is just a little bit too abstract, I think. However, like there are some really great writing moments on here, like the rust that grew between telephones that still sticks out to me, stuck out to me my first listen. So I'm going to put it in God tier for now, but I, I'm not going to stick to that decision. I may, I may choose to change that. Up next is truly the most perplexing song on the record, Antihero. Now I go back and forth with this one all the time because realistically in the grand scheme of like Taylor's big hits, the pop songs, the blank space, the shake it off, the style, the look what you made me do's, 
I think that Antihero is a B-tier Taylor Swift pop song. I don't think that it's bad, but I just don't think that it's like, it is the smash and like the representative, the girly giving out samples at Costco from Midnight's. Like she's the one that's showing everybody else what the album is all about. And I don't know if that bodes well for the album as a whole, because I do think that in general, like the writing on Antihero is kind of all over the place. And it's not like, it's not her most considered or sharp song. And she has definitely hidden some of her most, I guess, revealing thoughts in a TikTok song, because that's what this is. It's me, hi, I'm the problem, it's me, was a line specifically crafted to become a TikTok hit. And I don't really have a problem with that, but I do think that this song is a little bit lackadaisical and in a way like unfocused in a way that's not very um, appealing to me when I think about it conceptually. But then when it comes on, it, it's everything. <laughs> it's everything to me. I cannot stop dancing when I hear it. So like, I guess I got to put it in God tier because it just, it sticks out like that. Like she is that girl, whether I want to say that she's, you know, the smartest girl in the room or not. She's the, she's a very commanding girl. She certainly grabs your attention. Up next is Snow on the Beach. I'm putting this in meh. I mean, the only reason why I'm putting it in meh and not terrible is because I was so let down by that Lana Del Rey feature. And I don't know what I expected because Taylor is not like, especially known to, you know, share the mic with others when she has them on songs. But like Snow on the Beach in general, like it seems to me like a very bad hodgepodge of Taylor and Lana's songwriting. They both have this inclination to be a little bit vague to create ambiance, kind of like what was going on in Maroon. But I think that here they both leaned into their like lazier songwriting instincts. And I really don't believe that Lana was even all that involved in the writing process of this. I think maybe Jack and Taylor were working at that barbecue where they took the picture and Lana just wandered in and was like, Aurora Borealis green. I'd never seen someone lit from within. And they were like, yes, love that. And then she got a few backup vocals and that was her feature on the song. So that's going in meh for me. You're on your own, kid. I'm putting that in very, very good. Just because, not because I don't think that it's a God tier song, just because that it, it hasn't like super stuck with me or gripped me. And I'm being very selective with my God tier. I think that You're On Your Own Kid is a great song. I also think it would be a much better bookend. And that's a hint for what I'm about to do to this track list. But You're On Your Own Kid is a very like interesting, meaningful song. There is just this one part of it where it goes into the make the friendship bracelets, all of that. I think that gets into a little bit like prescriptive. It's like telling you to have an emotional release. Whereas I prefer to just, you know, let the emotions flow. I don't like to be instructed on where to cry, where to whatever. So that's like my little quibble with You're On Your Own Kid that kind of take, takes me out of the song whenever I hear it. So that's why it's going in very, very good. It's still an excellent song. I love the bridge, but it doesn't quite get there for me. A song that does get there for me is Midnight Rain and Midnight Rain goes straight into the God tier. And you know what? Everyone said that it was going to be a corny song. And I said, no, I said Midnight Rain is going to be my number one song. Is it my number, number one? Probably not, but it is certainly a God tier song. Midnight Rain is, is, is a good example of what Maroon could have been. It's like spare. It is like atmospheric. It's a little mysterious, but I think there are like more specific concrete details that we can ground ourselves in that like make more sense. And Midnight Rain also had such a strong showing when Midnight's came out. Like the public really connected with this song and with Lavender Haze. And I feel like the opening track of a new Taylor record is always going to land well and stay consistent in people's minds just because it's literally the first thing that they hear. But Midnight Rain is kind of like buried a little bit deeper down. And she, in the first couple of days at least, really had a strong showing on social media. So like I I think that Midnight Rain is great. I also love the vocoder. I love it whenever she uses it, not just when it's like on a song like Delicate. I think a lot of people had an issue with Midnight Rain and the way that the vocoder was used in it. I, some people thought it was a little bit too much. I personally thought it was just enough. And this is the kind of experimentation that I like to hear, which leads me into another kind of experimental song that is much maligned and not appreciated as much as I would believe that it deserves to be. And that is Question. Can I ask you a question? Why are you so fucking weird about giving this song the dues that it deserves? I love the breadcrumbing. I love the, I remember at the beginning of this song, I basically am obsessed with all the Haler content, even though I'm not really that much of a Haler. Like if I had to ship, I guess one thing in Taylor's like extensive dating history, that would be it. I just love this song because it's so crazy. And as a crazy person, I can relate to being so crazy. You know, she's saying like, it's just a question. It's just a question over and over again. And it's the most goddamn confrontational, 
rudest, invasive question you've ever heard in your entire life. And this song is like so weirdly specific. Like the chorus does not make sense. Like this song only makes sense to Taylor Swift and Harry Styles. Anyone else can only make guesses. And the fact that she said, you know, does it ever feel like nothing after that meteor strike will ever be the same? The fact that Joe like hears these songs and has nothing to say about it to her is kind of crazy to me. Like the fact that, you know, Taylor just gets away with saying this crazy ass shit. I mean, this song is also linked to all the other Taylor songs in my mind, right? So it's like the one and also out of the woods obviously she's literally telling us who the song was about so i don't see how you could argue with that but i think question is so good i love it when the beat really kicks in in that last chorus and i think that it's the most 1989 song on the record and i also think that this would be really fun at tour vigilante shit um i'm gonna go with not terrible but i'm literally only putting it there for the t like what she sang in this song is very profound and i love to hear scott borchetta and scooter braun get their comeuppance oh wait we forgot to do our prayer let's do it now Dear Lord, I uh, hope you're well. We really need Scott Borchetta and Scooter Braun to have the most irritating day of their lives today. Thank you. Amen. Hope you all said amen. So Vigilante shit goes into not terrible because, you know, we love to see Scooby-Doo on a stick being skewered in front of the crowd. Yes, we do. We love that. But it's not really a song. It's more like spoken word. And I'm not really into that. It is really like, I guess, reputation talk singing, but with no hook, like with no chorus. And it's very short as well. I feel like if Midnight's was a visual album and Vigilante shit was an interlude, I'm really thinking about that video that she has on the Spotify page for Vigilante shit, where it's just like her lips and it's like draw cat eyes sharp enough to kill a man. That shook me. That shook me to my core. I don't understand why Midnight's is not a visual album. I feel like, it, again, it would add something to what I am starting to think is not lackluster, but not the best Taylor Swift pop album of all time. I think it would have really added an element there. So Vigilante shit, I mean, we love her for the points that she served, but do I listen to it? Do I come back to it? No, I don't. Bejeweled. Now, my instinct is to put this in very, very good, but I think I'm going to have to put it into the God tier because it slaps, it bangs. And I don't know why on my first listen, I wasn't that into Bejeweled. I think that it was just because I was overwhelmed and... I, this happens to me sometimes when I listen to a Taylor Swift album for the first time, it's like being waterboarded. I'm trying to figure things out. I'm trying to have realizations. I'm also trying to figure out if I like it in the moment or not. And I think I just kind of brushed Bejeweled off and moved on to basically karma and was completely shaken to my core by that. But Bejeweled is really good and it's fun and it's sassy. And to me, it's like from that getaway car period of time, it's like the prelude to getaway car. And it's just like, it's got such a fun energy to it. And I love to hear about a bad bitch that knows her worth. And that's exactly what Taylor Swift is doing in this song. I love the kind of reputation performance that she's giving here too. There is like a three track run of very reputation songs on Midnight's and it's actually Bejeweled, Labyrinth and Karma. Labyrinth is going into meh for me because I can admit that it's not a bad song per se. It just, to me, it's one of those songs that it sounds like ear blood. Like I hear it and I cannot listen to it. Kind of like Dorothea, Paper Rings. Like I have a slew of songs that just do not agree with me somehow, just taste wise. Nothing to do with the lyrics. I just don't like it. I also think that Labyrinth like goes on for too long and it really suffers from that Jack thing of like putting in stupid, like pa pa, like weird self-indulgent like little flourishes and tricks that are not interesting and also Taylor's instinct to write these long rambling songs without cutting them down at the moment is really not translating very well into her pop arena. It works better for Folklore and Evermore. It doesn't work so well when we're trying to make a pop statement. And Labyrinth really does interrupt the flow of the record at this point, like going from Bejeweled to Labyrinth to Karma is just not appropriate. But I suppose we do have to take a breath before Karma because Karma is my boyfriend and that boyfriend is very demanding speaking of karma being my boyfriend karma goes straight into god tier why because it's iconic okay it's amazing it's you know wonderful it's never been done before i think that karma is you know i haven't returned to it as much as i thought i would just because it is like that campy song i don't want to dilute it by listening to it too much i do this thing where i play songs to death one of the only taylor songs that i haven't played to death are like holy ground and cruel summer like i can really truly listen to those every single day and get away car too and not get tired of them i think karma will get there but i don't want to do like an initial overload you know which is what i'm trying to stray away from but karma is so fun and that chorus is going to be literally amazing live and i have a whole video breaking down karma so i don't even really need to explain to you why it's the greatest song of all time just know that it is sweet nothing is a sweet nothing so i'm just gonna put it in not terrible because it is not terrible and it has grown on me a little bit 
I just, with Sweet Nothing, it's like, again, we've done this before. We've done the I love Joe and I want to hide from the world and I'm feeling fragile thing. Like, I get it. We get it. We've been there. We've done that. There is something nice here in the bridge. I think the the idea of her being too soft for it all is a moment that we all have when we feel overwhelmed and like not tough enough to fight like the smallest, most mundane battle. Just when you're having one of those like very sensitive, like I am a raw nerve to the world moment. I relate to that feeling so I can take it out of meh and put it in not terrible. Speaking of things that are not terrible and actually are much better than not terrible, Mastermind. I kind of want to put Mastermind in God tier and move Maroon down into very, very good. Now, I know that people are going to go fucking crazy at me because Maroon has its stance, but Mastermind is so funny and clever and knowing, and I love the atmospheric, like, build up to it. It's almost like a theme song to a TV show. If you've ever seen the TV show uh, Industry on HBO, it really reminds me of that introduction. And I love the the swell and the build up and the intensity of it. Taylor's really letting her crazy calculating side come out. I'm only cryptic and Machiavellian because I care. Like that's truly only a line that Taylor Swift could deliver that became endearing, you know? So I really love Mastermind. It's grown on me so much since it came out. And it is a great bookend, but I think there's a better one on this album and I'll make you stay tuned for that. The Great War. I just don't like this song. Again, I really, the, the sound of it is just whatever. I think it's a very bland, boring, general, vague song. I'm gonna put it in meh. A lot of people seem to go really crazy for it. If you are obsessed with The Great War, I, that said, tells me a lot about you and like what kind of Taylor Swift songs you like. I bet you also love Daylight. I bet you do. I bet that's another one of your favorite songs. The Great War to me is like so fucking simple. And what I hate about these really simple songs like Daylight and The Great War is when people try to over intellectualize it to make it seem as though it is much bigger than it is just because they want to justify loving it. And it's like, bestie, you can love something that, that's not that complicated or, or intense. I love karma. Com well, karma is very complicated and intense, but you know what I mean, okay? You can just love your songs without having to make them the best song ever in every single album. Like, I'm not going to sit here and make the argument that the last time a song that I love on Red or even Holy Ground are the best songs on that album. There are other songs that really, you know, are objectively better. I just love those more. So if you love The Great War, I'm so happy for you. But that doesn't mean that it's one of the best songs on the album because it's not objectively. Just, you know, when you're comparing it to all of the other superstars, like you're telling me that The Great War is better than Midnight Rain and Bejeweled and and karma and and question even i know everybody loves to hate on question but like come on beloved the great war is like taylor swift on autopilot like it's really not that big a deal bigger than the whole sky i'm also gonna put this in meh which makes me want to kind of put it in not terrible because i do like bigger than the whole sky like i feel positively towards it i just don't return to it a lot there's been a lot of discussion on the content and the subject matter of what it's about i don't care to engage in that particular vein of speculation but i like it again I think that this album is bloated, especially with the 3 a.m. tracks, and it really needed some consolidation. I'm not uh, primarily against a long Taylor Swift album. I am against like bloating something out just for the sake of having more content. I do wish that Taylor would return to being a little bit more discerning and selective about what statements she wants to make, because this really, to me, Midnight's in general, is one of those like throw spaghetti at the wall and see what sticks albums. It doesn't have a super clear focus. And I also think that the marketing of it and the, the conceit and the metaphor that she laid it up with is kind of misleading into the the depth of the content that we got because I really do think a lot of these songs, even the, the most deep ones on this record, are only scratching the surface of what we have come to expect from Taylor. So that's my long kind of explanation for why Bigger Than The Whole Sky is not terrible. Paris. I, I know that this is not a very, very good song, but like, I really like to listen to it. It's fun. It's just fun. There is that awful, terrible, cringy line about like, the shade and the tree, but that's just, you know, sometimes that's something Taylor does. Sometimes she has to like break up a really good song by putting in a really terrible lyric in it. It's just, it is kind of a rite of passage for Taylor on each album. Like she can't have one fully executed sleigh. Paris is kind of a nothingy song though. Okay, I'm gonna put it in not terrible. It doesn't really deserve to be in very, very good when I'm not letting like Sweet Nothing or Bigger Than The Whole Sky into very, very good. But it's, it's fun. I like the beat. It's just not that serious, my dears. And speaking of not that serious, high infidelity. 
not today. I think that people are obsessed with this because it's like a tea song, but this song to my ears, the bleep bloop, it's like king of my heart. This is a specific kind of Taylor Swift song that really I just don't like. So I do not revisit it. I like the, do you really want to know where I was April 29th? Do I really have to chart the constellations in his eyes? Like there are some nice lyrical moments on this, but like I shall not listen to this song. It really bothers me. I don't want to hear it. Glitch, very, very good. I love Glitch. Glitch, again, is one of three songs on this album, Karma, Glitch, and Lavender Haze, that is not made with Jack Antonoff, I believe. It's with this other production trio. And I really like the vibe of this song. This song has a really well curated atmosphere. And I like that it's like very kind of like shrug off the shoulder vibe. The only thing I don't like about Glitch is I feel like the bridge gets a little teeny tiny bit lazy. That's romance, let's dance. I mean, that's 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 lazy. Let's not do that. But otherwise, Glitch is, is fun. I like the production elements on it. And it has this really like dreamy, catchy hook. And it's a really good like chill song. It's a chill vibe pop song that I enjoy. Would have, could have, should have. Now, how angry do I want to make the girls today? Would have, could have, should have. Let me just put it in very, very good while I explain. Would have, could have, should have is, first of all, what I thought the whole general kind of vibe of Midnight's would be. It's very ambiguous. Again, it writes in generalizations. It gets very specific towards the end. And we have that payoff, that line that is very kind of like jarring and confessional and heartbreaking. I'm going to put it into God tier because I think that it's probably one of the best written songs on the album. But that's really not saying much because the songwriting to me is B level, B minus, C plus even. Like this is not Taylor's most focused or considered works. I love the bridge and I love the vocal delivery of what it could have, should have. But do I think as an entire statement of a song, does it hit the way that it should hit? Given what it could do, given the information that we got on the bridge, it's like melodically, it's not really in line with what the theme of the song is about. So I'll put it in God tier. And also going into God tier is Dear Reader. Now, my God tier is looking really big. I'm thinking that I might have to drop some stuff out of it. What can I take out of God tier? It's just looking a little too bloated. I think I need to make it fair. Let's bring Bejeweled down into very, very good. Again, this is my personal ranking. This is how I feel about Midnight's. So I'm gonna put Bejeweled down. Would have, could have, should have. I actually, I wanna put would have, could have, should have down. And I wanna put Bejeweled back up. You're literally watching my capricious mind work. It's magic in front of you. I, yeah, mm, this is hard. I don't really know. I'm definitely putting Dear Reader in the God tier because Dear Reader speaks to me. I love the kind of like literariness of it. I love the implications. I love the breaking of the fourth wall, her addressing the audience, like kind of painting herself as an unreliable narrator and giving these like snippets of wisdom. The bridge is beautiful. It crescendos really beautifully. It has a really nice vocal delivery. I also like that it has that glitchy kind of interference within it. I love Dear Reader, and I think that it would be an excellent bookend to Midnight's. So I am putting it in God tier. Would have, could have, should have. Yes, I'm keeping it in very, very good because, I don't know, it just doesn't make it up there for me. I'm kind of feeling like I want to also pull Antihero or Bejeweled down there. I tried Bejeweled and it didn't feel right. Maybe Antihero will feel right. I don't know. Antihero is kind of a sleigh. I'm going to keep her in God tier. So that means I have the most God tiers out of them all. So you guys can stop calling me a hater, okay? Look how many songs I have in positive places. There's literally only like four songs kind of in negative positions here. And you know what? Yeah, I'm going to leave it there. I'm happy with that. That is my tier ranking of Midnight. All right, so now I'm going to do my reshuffle. And I did this very intuitively. So let's see if I can articulate properly why I have decided to reshuffle all of these songs into their specific places. But I guess one of my main problems with Midnight's, again, is that the writing is really inconsistent throughout the record and the track list is super chaotic. And per usual, Taylor does not want to create a story here. So I'm trying to create a story and let's just see what I managed to come up with. I have cut a few songs off of this, actually more than I thought that I would. So, I mean, you guys are just gonna have to deal with it. And if you disagree, that's totally fine, but leave a respectful comment. Don't be rude about it. Okay, so first up, the bookends of a Taylor Swift album are very important. The beginning of the album sets the scene for where we're going to go. A great example of a fantastic bookend is State of Grace. It is beautifully written. It's quite complex. It has a bunch of different themes and threads that are laid up in it that we explore throughout the record. And then 
The final book end, the, the closing song, brings us to a conclusion. It arrives us somewhere that the album took us, right? Because I always feel like I want to go on a journey with a record. I want to start somewhere thinking one thing and end thinking another or having a realization about something, especially when it comes to a Taylor Swift album. So my main problem with Lavender Haze actually is that it is the opening track to Midnight's. And like sonically, it is a good opening track because it has that vibe. But putting Meet Me at Midnight in the first kind of intro line to a song does not make it a good bookend. Lavender Haze has a very specific specific narrow focus and that focus is on as I mentioned earlier before hating the media wanting to get married but not wanting to be pressured into it loving your London boy and having your paper rings blah 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 like we get it girl we've been there before we've done that journey I do not advocate Lavender Haze going off the album it has its place but I do not think that it deserves to be the opening track I think that we should have a clearer mission statement and I'm actually really not opposed to starting off this album with a bit more of a chill vibey song because Midnight's on the whole actually isn't very upbeat bangers it's not super like high energy and I think that's why the pacing of it is kind of weird when it's inconsistent because it has these sudden brief bursts of energy and then these like long slogs of nothing so what I've tried to do is combine the 3am songs and the standard edition into one album and I'm not having bonus tracks because I feel like this album was bloated and I think that it would be better if it had less songs and was structured in a more organized and coherent way. So I'm gonna start it with Dear Reader. Yes, I am. That is my introduction to this album because I feel like it poses a lot of questions. It sets her up as this unreliable narrator and it encourages the reader, the listener to keep being interested. And it has that kind of like that vibey thing that a lot of the other songs on this record have. So after Dear Reader, we go straight into Antihero, number two, track two. I think that Antihero belongs up top because, you know, Dear Reader is kind of about like her her insecurities and, you know, being someone who's falling apart and Antihero definitely absolutely follows that conclusion. And I'm really trying to have the track five be the payoff here or the kind of the moment where we switch into more fun stuff. So I want to get the like heavier, more introspective, um, dastardly content out of the way up top. So I have Dear Reader, then we go into Antihero. And then track three is kind of a free for all. I could see a case being made to have Sweet Nothing or Labyrinth here. So I'm going for a chill kind of introduction to the album. Sweet Nothing is, you know, it does kind of touch on Taylor's anxieties about like, the world outside of her, which is something that we address both on Antihero and Dear Reader. Labyrinth, however, addresses her more kind of like internal struggle and her um, personal journey that she went on when she was falling in love after, you know, having a rock bottom with her reputation. So I actually think I would put, even though I prefer Sweet Nothing as a song, I would maybe put Labyrinth here instead. And after Labyrinth, I would go into track four, which is Midnight Rain. And Midnight Rain is one of those songs that like is a little bit more upbeat and mysterious, but it definitely has a dark undercurrent to it. And it has a kind of like, I'm looking for love in the wrong places. I'm making these mistakes. I don't really understand why I'm doing it. I'm losing good people along the way. I'm losing control control of my instincts, right? So that's track four, which leads into track five, our emotional high and payoff moment on the album. You're on your own kid to me is not a track five. It's a bookend. Track five that I have put in this scenario is what it could have should have, because it is the most obvious kind of like catharsis moment on the album. And I think that it is a release after all these kind of like anxious anxiety songs about like Taylor's position as a public figure, but also as a partner and also finding love and being able to sustain that love and looking in the right places rather than chasing the wrong things. Would have, could have, should have is literally about like, you know, God bless my soul. I'm, I'm not who I used to be. The tomb won't close. It's about unfinished business. And I think that a lot of the stuff preceding it is still unfinished business to this day. So I think that having would have, could have, should have here is a good kind of midnight's moment to have as the track five, you know, those calls that you make in the middle of the night that you wouldn't have made otherwise because you stayed up too late and you're spiraling. That is where would have, could have, should have is. And I know the argument is that the 3 a.m. tracks are like a different kind of track, but the Midnight's tracks themselves did not follow that conceit. So I don't even think that that distinction matters. Track six is Maroon. So after that kind of like emotional high, we are recovering a little bit. Maroon is again, really dark, but there is kind of like a dreamy kind of like aesthetic, hazy, like almost Lana-esque vibe to it actually, very like ultra violence oriented. So we go from what it could have should have to Maroon at track six. Track seven is Glitch because again, I think Glitch also has that vibey kind of, we're picking up the pace a little bit, right? So instead of having like up, down, up, down, we've gone kind of like down, up, coasting 
down and then we're slowly climbing back up again tempo and pacing wise so track seven is glitch which goes straight into track eight which is bejeweled and i think sequentially those songs follow a period of time as well maroon glitch and bejeweled that actually to me feels like the correct chronological order of the actual events that are listed and charted in those songs you can go back and forth about like exactly which one precedes which but i think they were all written in the same they're all written about the same period of time and i think that that order of them makes the most sense progressively you know maroon is like kind of looking back on something and being like damn like you know that's a real fucking legacy to leave glitch is like moving on from that kind of high relationship and being like oop this was a mistake that i made and bejeweled is about you know settling down with someone for a little bit too long after you already know what a good relationship looks like because you've been through it before or an exciting relationship you've experienced it with maroon you know where someone's willing to play this high stakes game with you and then bejeweled is kind of all about like you know what i need to know my fucking worth it's the getaway car moment of this album so after bejeweled track eight we get into track nine which is karma and are you noticing this very reputation run run of songs here like maroon glitch bejeweled karma all super reputation -y songs so we get into karma because i want to like get into the fun part of this album because there are more fun upbeat boppy lovey-dovey songs on this record to arrive back at and karma is a real turning point because it's like tongue-in-cheek it's still you know getting revenge but it's also kind of signaling like i'm better bitch like i'm doing fine i'm on some new shit you have no say over what i do and after that we get straight into number 10 which is question of course question gets to stay on this record because question like is still about unfinished business right like i think a lot of this album is actually about that about things that you thought were over but actually have kind of gone on in the back of your head as this low hum the entire time and question is one of those songs that is like subtly confrontational but also fun like i feel like the perspective that she has in this song is that she knows that this this is not going to get started up again and that this is a thing that happened to her in her past but like the messy part of her just can't help but wonder she just wants to ask you a question okay number 11 11 is the great war now you know i'm being unbiased because i'm putting a song that i don't like on this track list i think it makes sense you know question is kind of like a fun take on a breakup or a situation that didn't end so well and the great war is kind of like pasting over it and being like you know what we got through something i'm not looking at this as all like one relationship story i'm really just going on vibes and themes and feelings and the great war is really kind of like you know pasting over that period of time that was rough and also looking back on it a little bit fondly thinking like wow damn i had to like conquer so many uh i had to wow i had to slay so many dragons to get to where i am but now finally i'm here and i'm having fun i'm bopping and i like the beat and that's exactly what's happening in the great war track 12 is mastermind because you know after the great war ended and she like made it through to her true love she found the promised land then she had to let him know she had to fill him in she was like this was my plan the entire time all this shit that i did before all this you know asking people questions being messy like going out and maybe cheating on my partner and bejeweled and uh, you know, having little brief interruptions and slight malfunctions. Now I have finally arrived at the place that I want to be. And also I want to let you know that I'm not crazy. I had this plan the entire time. Every bait and switch was a work of art. And that is why we put Mastermind exactly in this place. Track 13 is Lavender Haze. Lavender Haze is still a good song and it deserves to be on the track list for sure. And I think that people have responded really positively to it. And also like we know that Taylor is at a place where she's like happy and confident and feeling good in her relationships, even with all the shit that comes from it externally like from outside sources putting pressure on her blah 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 we know that ultimately at the end of every taylor swift album like she still has this going on in her life and it's like kind of the main compass she might go back and forth she might ask a couple of questions she might revisit a glitch but at the end of the day she wants to stay in that lavender haze that's kind of like the place she is always trying to be at and that is where she is in track 13. finally we conclude the album this is the final track track 14 so i've cut what three or four songs off the record the final final song the conclusion that brings us all back around and shows us the journey that we have you know been on and, and gone through is you're on your own kid you're on your own kid really truly is like taylor looking back on a past version of herself and giving her her younger self that was not really knowing what she was going to do with her life or feeling insecure or whatever it was a hug and dear reader is kind of the opposite of that dear reader is kind of the current self looking at her current self and being like uh, girl I don't know why people want to be taking all this advice from me or like listening to what I do with myself. Like I just am kind of lost and confused all the time. And you're on your own kid really has that kind of like that self wisdom and resilience and knowledge that she's built up over time. And I think that it's a beautiful place to end the record songs that got cut Paris doesn't add to the story. It's vague. It's random snow on the beach also doesn't add to the story. Vague random 
I mean, what else? Like sweet nothing, I guess, gets cut because I put Labyrinth there instead. Sorry, babe. You know, we have to create a good album and you don't get to be on it. Vigilante shit. We cover that ground in Karma. It doesn't also need to be on the album. It could have been an interlude. It wasn't in the visual, you know, universe. So that doesn't get put in. High Infidelity. I think we get all of the information that we need from High Infidelity on the run between Maroon, Glitch, and Bejeweled. Like, I just don't think that there's anything a high infidelity adds there in my opinion it's not the best of those four songs that are about kind of the same thing and then bigger than the whole sky because i really don't see how that fits into this album literally at all so that is it that is my entire ranking midnights and fixing the track list let me know what you think of my new track list maybe i should make a spotify playlist with it and you can give it a listen and we can see if it's good i'll link it down below if i can be bothered to do that and yeah i'm so grateful for this year and all of the new subscribers that i've gained and the audience and community that we've built we're gonna have a patreon coming soon new podcast episodes on their way and it would mean the world to me if you guys would go and check out the vlogs that i'm currently making episode three of solo in tokyo is going to come so soon and i can't wait for you to see it all right goodbye swifties